One, two, three, four, let's go. It's hardly. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. I heard the Alaska. It's hardly. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. Today, we travel from Southeast Alaska, the home of the Tlingit people, all the way up to the Yupik home of Russian Mission Alaska. It's a great show. And by the way, I'm Jeannie. I'm Lindsay. <laughs> I'm Alex. I'm Erica. <laughs> Heartbeat Alaska would like to thank the following sponsors for making our show possible Browns Electric. Thank you, Browns Electric, for your generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska would like to thank Cognac Incorporated. Without their support, this show would not be possible. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Comtech Business Systems Incorporated and by the Maniluk Association providing health and social services to residents of Northwest Alaska for over 30 years. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Ed's Kasilov Seafoods. Hello everyone and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining me. Every week on Heartbeat Alaska we travel from one area of the state to another just like the youth did in this program. They traveled from Juneau, Alaska, home of the Clinkets, all the way up to Russian Mission, home of the Yupik people. <laughs> Meet the gang. I'm Lindsay. <laughs> I'm Alex. I'm Erica. I'm Jill. I'm Joey. I'm Allie. A group of students from Juno and their teacher who have traveled from Southeast Alaska to learn a different culture, a different way of doing things, and to have the experience of their lives for one entire week. It's part of a program called the Rose Urban Rural Exchange, a statewide program that takes participants from different cultures and backgrounds and submerges them into another. On the banks of the Yukon River, 50 miles from the western coast of Alaska, five high school students and their teacher left the fast-paced life of Juneau to experience life in the Yupik village of Russian Mission for one week. It would be a week that this group would not soon forget. Just as soon as the plane landed in Russian Mission, the group from Juneau was escorted to the school and preparations for the first part of their journey began. Uh, we started out, uh, took the kids to a camp that uh, the school has built uh, at Keiko Landing. It's about six miles upriver in Keiko Creek. The landing is there, uh, it used to be, a, uh, it is tribal land, they used to have a summer camps there about 20 years ago. Um, we got permission from the tribe to build a cabin there and it's a nice convenient place. There's some good fishing there at, at times and uh, it's, a, it's a really pretty spot. Uh, it gives us a place we can ski to on cross-country skis and uh, get kids involved in outdoor activities that way. Well it was hard at first just to try and figure out how, every, how everything moves and how you're supposed to go about it but once you really get into the groove it's a lot of fun especially when you got a nice wind pushing you along and I suck at cross-country skiing it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> but I didn't fall on the way back it was like what like five six miles I was just skiing and at first like when we were going out there it was like the wind so so hard and 
You didn't even need to ski, you could just stand there and the wind would just push you all the way up. When we went out, uh, we had to go on a seven mile cross country ski track that I've never cross country skied, so that was, that was a hell of a workout. And, uh, but everybody else was pretty supportive. We went out with uh, Yak, who's gonna come down and stay with us, and he was hauling. It was fun. It was hard kind of skiing, because it was a long way. And um, the guy who was with us, the guy who was leading us, we'd gone like, I don't know, four or five miles, and he goes, oh yeah, so we're halfway now, and we're all like, oh my God, we're only halfway. Eventually, everyone made it to camp and took a well-deserved break. But when you're in camp, there's work that must be done, and plenty of it. We spent the night uh, in the cabin, had the kids get firewood and build fires and uh, take care of the snow, four feet of snow on the roof of the cabin, which is necessary to, to keep the uh, integrity of the roof and all that. And they and give the kids a chance to talk. They talk pretty late into the night you know, uh, with the other kids from Russian Mission. Well, I've winter camped a few times with my friends, but it wasn't nearly as quite as extreme as this time. We had to shovel about four feet of snow off the roof of the cabin. and It was got really cold during the night, but I had all my gear, so it was, it worked. The next morning, everyone packed up camp and headed back to the village where part two of the journey got underway. A caravan of snow machines headed to a second camp that the school has 20 miles upriver, where the kids had a chance to experience ice fishing. Ice fishing is a popular activity here on the Yukon, where pike can grow as large as four feet or more in length. I didn't catch anything. Um, it, was, it was kind of cold and it was not exciting. Ice fishing is not an exciting thing to do. You just sit there and jerk the stick up and down. In my, in my case, you don't catch anything. But it was exciting when other people caught stuff because they just pulled it out and whacked it. And that was really cool. We went ice fishing and one of the guys here, Max, went with me for a while. And it was pretty cool because we stayed out there. We got out there early in the morning and I went ice fishing with him and I caught myself a nice like 35 inch pike and it was the first fish I ever caught, so I'm happy. There were a lot of new experiences for the group from Juno, from the first time on a snow machine to the first time catching pike. The experiences quickly turned into an adventure. Alex and I, we caught two pike, or I caught two, he caught one. We had a race going. You gotta be patient, and you're actually using a stick and string, and uh, you tie a hook on there, and, and chop up some, some little fish that you caught earlier, and, put it back in there and just up and down. Make sure, you, Max says you gotta make sure you jerk it a little so that the fish can see it and you track the fish. <laughs> Let's see, I tried pike eggs. They really kinda just taste good. Just good, that's it, that's the word for it. <laughs> in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. Six months ago, Claire made a promise to her family and to herself. The promise was she'd quit smoking by the time her next birthday came around. And already, she's feeling better. She has more stamina, more energy, and her lungs are stronger than ever before. surprising things I think for the youth from Juno was not really the lay of the land or the or the different foods or the way people lived but it was just how 
friendly everyone was. Besides all the activities that were lined up for the students, there were other aspects of village life that stuck out for the kids from Juno. Everybody's been really nice to me, um, especially the little kids. They're really, really friendly, and all the guys that have basically donated their time to drive us around and show us all the places have been really nice. Um, I think some of uh, like the high school guys are kind of shyer. At least they haven't talked to me much, but lately they've been talking more, I guess. And, um, I'm excited for them to come to Juno and see everything. But Everybody here is really, really friendly. Like, um, if you go to Juno, like, nobody stops and says hi to you. And here everybody's like, oh, hi, where are you from? How, how long are you guys going to be here? And especially the little kids, the little kids are all really nice. And they all want to hold your hand and shake your hand and get picked up and stuff. I've never experienced anything like this. I mean, we're not, we're not allowed to ride the snowmobiles because it's a liability, but just seeing them everywhere, you know, I'm used to, you know, horns and cars and people yelling as they drive by. And here it's, you know, you have six and seven year olds running around on their very own snowmobiles. And yeah, I'm having a hard time just staying on as a passenger, you know. It's, it's insane. It makes me, I love snowmobiling now, and I, I want to come back here sometime. The most surprising thing is uh, not really the differences, but the similarities. Um, everybody here is, you know, you think it's going to be so different, but, and there are some, some differences, but the thing is that everybody's a lot like everybody. You know, every, everybody uh, has the same, a lot of the same likes and dislikes and hopes, and so you lock, walk into somebody's house, and you know, it looks a lot like home. But everybody here knows everybody, and there's never anybody who's doesn't smile or wave at you or, I mean, everybody's been like open arms, I guess, for us. And here, I mean, like back at home, there's n nothing like that, really. Living in a big city, nobody would notice if you wandered off. And here, if you walked off, somebody would say something, especially not being from here. We kind of stand out, I, I am told. It's very e easy to have a limited view of the way people live or should live. And I think this has really broken their world open to think about the way other people live and not think that our way is better. I mean, especially Lindsay, she's blown away by this. I mean, I think it's a huge problem with humans is that we can't get in other people's shoes in this program. You know, that's the main focus is walking around in someone else's snowshoes for a week. And that's exactly what these youth did. With the help of community members and school staff, they were submerged in the Yupik culture, participating in everyday activities of village life. One activity that needed to be done was checking the fish trap. But in order to get to the fish trap, they needed to take a sled ride downriver. It's been really fun. I've really been enjoying pretty much everything we do, except for that sled ride behind the snow machine was a little too bumpy for my liking, but... Snow covered and chilled to the bone, they arrived at the lush fish trap and began clearing the snow. The trap is this area right here that you see where they haven't gotten the snow. And then the sticks you see going towards the bank is the fence. And the fence extends from the trap all the way to the bank of the river. And so as the fish come in with the current and swim down, they follow along the trap and then the next spot where they enter through is through into the trap. We went down and checked, uh, checked um, fish traps. It's a project for the elementary schoolers. We uh, checked out some, they have a uh, lush fish down there they're catching and they have a really cool um, uh, setup for their trap. It has, involves a fence and uh, then a big trap and got to get out some of those and Lindsay kissed a few. That was a lot of fun. They look like catfish. I got, I got to kiss one. That was pretty exciting. He's cute. <laughs> <laughs> the trap was awesome and the fact that the little kids learned how to make them make the traps and set the traps and learned all about the traps and I don't know the education here I think is pretty cool how they tie in everything especially with like um, I was talking to one of the teachers and making sure that the kids trust that if you you set the trap it's for fish fish to eat and it builds this big trust between teachers and students here Two of the youth from Russian Mission took the liberty of showing the Juno kids how to set traps on the trap line, where they caught marmot, rabbit, and even a lynx this past season. We went trapping today and we figured out how traps work and how to set traps, and I was afraid that Joey might get his hand caught in the little thing, but I guess he was all right. I didn't give it a go because I like my fingers. Um, 
but Joey tried it and that was pretty crazy. Trapping was so cool and the guys that took us trapping were just so yeah. into it that it was just amazing to me. Normally if someone just was carrying around a rabbit like this and ripped open the gut right in front of you, you might be a little concerned in the city, but here I guess that's perfectly normal to rub the guts all over trees to make it smell really nice. They showed us how to open up the traps and how to set them and how to set up uh, little cubbies, as they call them, for lynx traps. And we, uh, as we were coming back, we, they uh, shot a um, hare, and that was really cool. No, actually, it was a cottontail. That's what they said it was. And that was really exciting. And we came back, and we watched the uh, start of the races, the um, dog sled races. That's right, dog sled races. The students from Juno arrived in Russian Mission for the start of the annual Winter Carnival, where people from all over the Yukon Delta come together for a week, packed full of races, dancing, potlatches, and more. We walked down to the dog sled races. We were followed by about 10, 20 kids who wanted to hold our hands, point out everything where they live, tell us everybody in the whole town that they're related to. Um, so it felt like Pied Piper marching through town, and then we all got to ride a little bit on the dog sleds. So that was definitely new. And so I just today really felt like we were kind of part immersed in the community. We've been kind of going out of the community the last couple of days, and it's been nice to not really be on schedule and just to walk around and talk to people all day. It's tax season, and living in rural Alaska means that it could take weeks, even months, to get your tax returns in the mail. It's always two weeks sometimes six to eight weeks if I remember correct. Let Liberty Tax take away the worry and the wait. Simply pick up the phone and call toll free 1-866-563-2700. You can file your taxes electronically from the comfort of your home. You can usually have your check on at Gold Street the very next day. I go through John Hostetter. I trust him. I think I've got more on my returns with him than I would by myself. Liberty Tax guarantees the largest refunds at a smaller price and can often put money in your pocket the very same day. Quick and easy for me. So don't wait around for your tax returns in the mail. Give Liberty Tax a call. Liberty Tax, specializing in rural Alaska. Fast, friendly, trustworthy. That's how I feel with them. John's good people. On your next visit to Anchorage, be sure to stay at the Creekwood Inn and RV Park. Now under new management, the Creekwood Inn offers 26 newly renovated rooms and a cabin that sleeps six. If you're in town for an event, the Creekwood Inn is the nearest hotel to the Sullivan Arena. The Creekwood Inn also has 68 RV spaces available year-round and offers winter RV storage with water, electric, sewer, and cable. The Creekwood Inn and RV Park is a proud sponsor of the Iditarod Fur Rendezvous and the Alaska Fighting Championships. So the next time you're in Anchorage, visit us at the Creekwood Inn and RV Park. To the Rose Urban Rural Exchange Program. Youth from Juno traveled to Russian Mission and boy did they find a whole new world. A world of similarities but lots of differences. Yeah, I know I've just heard about village life but I've never really been here and experienced it and living here with the families and you know walking around and doing all these cool activities has really you know, connected me with village life. There are some similarities but everything's just so different it seems than here. And what differences there are. With Juno's bustling city life of traffic, shops and the state capital, urban life is vastly different compared to Russian Mission with less than 1% of Juno's 33,000 people. There are no tall buildings, no cars, and definitely a slower pace of life. What Russian mission lacks in urban culture, they more than make up in personal culture. There's this incredible warmth in the people here, but you kind of have to reach out to them. And once once you make the first move, they're very talkative. But, but um, there's kind of this quiet, or a lot of nonverbal communication that's that's very different. Um, especially with 
kind of the teenage people. It seems like the young kids, they come up to us and they want to ask us questions, but kind of late middle school to high school, they're really reticent. And it's been, it's been hard to kind of break them open and get them to talk to us. The town is much smaller than I thought it would be, and I was thinking pretty small. So, uh, you know, in that way, yeah, it's, it's a lot different than what I thought it would be. It's, it's great, though. Everybody here is so nice and supportive. Um, all the little kids know my name and all, you know, the girls and Joey, and we just walk down the street and you end up a bunch of little kids throwing snowballs at you and want you to pick them up. And it, it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. I think I'm, I'm taking a lot more from this um, than I thought I would have. I pretty much thought that the houses wouldn't be really nice on the outside or really big or anything, but I figured everyone would have a lot of technology like snow machines and satellite TV and those type of things. Um, I was a little surprised at, I guess, just how nice everyone's clothing was and that type of thing because I really didn't see uh, how they were making money at all. But Casey, the school teacher I'm staying with, kind of explained um, their lifestyles and how they were subsistence and also um, how the, the government welfare is kind of hurting the, basically hurting their culture. I wondered why it was here and it was one of the first Russian settlements, why they selected this place, but it seems pretty rich in resources. Russian Mission is a Yupik village that was first established as a fur trading post by a Russian-American fur company in 1837. Twenty years later, it was home to the first Russian Orthodox mission and was called Pokrovskaya Mission. The village's name was changed to Russian Mission in 1900. It's also known as Ikarmut, or Yupik for people of the point. In 1890, there were 143 residents. That number swelled to 350 by 1902. The population was then nearly wiped out by the 1940s due to a smallpox epidemic. The population has slowly climbed to where it is today. The Rose Urban Rural Exchange was created in 1999 to build understanding between metropolitan cities and the rural villages by mutual respect, understanding, and a statewide sense of community through a cross-cultural exchange. It was named after Senator Ted Stevens, former Chief of Staff Mitch Rose, who had himself spent time in rural villages when growing up. The program works by recruiting schools in urban and rural communities. The teachers in these schools then select the students to participate in the program. Students from each location spend a week immersed in the other's culture and lifestyle. Round trip airfare between the villages and cities is paid for by a U.S. Department of Education grant through the Alaska Humanities Forum. The students are housed by either the school or host families, so the only cost to them is time. The sister school program is open to middle schools and high schools. Sponsored by the Alaska Humanities Forum, who's uh, here in Alaska, and they've just made everything so easy. I mean, they, they make sure that the kids have uh, equipment that they need. You know, kids from the city, they got them helmets for snow machines. Uh, they, the support has been tremendous, and they have, uh, they have prearranged uh, lessons so the kids could get an understanding of what it is that, that we're, we're trying to get them to understand about each other. You know, how is it, what's your community like, how many people live there, how many in the school, what's the modes of transportation, what do you eat, where do you get your food, and all these things before they ever got here. And uh, the, they've, they've got a really good program set up to make sure that uh, um, these kids are going to really understand a lot about, they're going to understand a lot about each other and their, each other's way of life. While this may have been a week of new, fun, and exciting experiences, this was after all also a school trip. These five teens have memories to last a lifetime, but they have taken much more out of this. When asked if other students should get involved in this program. Without a doubt, do it. It's an amazing experience. It's something that's really different from something, anything you'd ever do back home. So. If you really want an adventure, this is the place to go. It, this is one of the best experiences I've had in a long time. I don't, you know, really get out too much, and when I do, you know, I'm just going to a bigger city. So it's it's very humbling, I think, just seeing how they live and how, you know, they know how to survive without much at all. And, you know, I, I mean, I knew it was possible, but I, I've never seen it done. 
And so it was, it was good for me to see that, and I think it'd be good for them. I actually really want to come back. I'm going to ask my parents if I can come back in the summer to see what this place looks like in the summer. And then, so we'll see how it goes from there. But you can make some friends here. <laughs> if you're looking for friends, this is the place to make them. I just think really how friendly the people were and how welcoming they were and accepting that we were getting a chance to look at, get a peek into their lifestyle and their culture. I, yeah, I felt that was a really neat part of this experience. It's neat that we can travel so far but still be in Alaska and be able to see such differences in diversity and culture. I think it's fantastic. I think it's brilliant. Um, just, again, as I said, for people to see a world beyond their own, I mean, I doubt they might choose to live in a community like this, but just to know that this exists and that there are viable, valid, beautiful lifestyles beyond what they know and what they're used to. And likewise for the, you know, the kids coming our way to see what our life's like. I think it's great. And I'm really looking forward to taking these guys to Juno because I think it's going to be as much of a surprise for them as, as it was for the kids from Juno. <laughs>